and uh, w we've covered a lot of things. Uh, obviously, um, things are happening in our society that we're faced with. Oh, by the way, um, one other thing. Did you know that our government has asked the UN to come in and police us because we're a racist country? Did you know that? Yeah. And did you know there's training exercise where we have foreign soldiers on our property here in the United States right now? So... Yeah, there's 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 things that are being pushed, things that are that are happening, that uh, we need to just be at least o aware of. Um, that was the head, that was the Secretary of State that said that, invited the UN forces to come into the United States because we have a race problem, and uh, so they're going to help us police it. Um, so. Uh, we, we just know that as we see the events happening, even from the American perspective, that it really is important for us to be strong. And I want to I address that tonight. Um, I do think we're in the last two-minute run and that we need to make sure that we are, are, are prepared in our hearts and our minds and our spirits. Uh, because I think there's going to be some, well, I'll talk about that. So, any qu any question that you might have, uh, Justin. Yeah, that's been going on for a while, and then you've had some droughts in some of the other major grain producing nations. Brazil has had a great so what they're doing is, and, and part of the problem is that, they're, that, that farmers are destroying it. They, they can't get it to market. They don't, there's no, people don't want to work. So it, a, lot, a lot of what we're going to see happening in the next two or three months is because it's, a, it's not a labor shortage. It's a labor, people don't want to work. And the government's paying them not to work. So it's a supply chain that is a problem. It's not that there's not goods out there, but if I can't get it to market, if I can't do it, uh, then I have to do something with what I've got. And there, uh, and again, there's some incentives incentives to destroy what they do have. So we just need to be aware of these things and uh, be conscious of it. Well, let's. Uh, uh, any other comment or question? And also, also, I would like if you, if there's something that you would like, a topic you would like for me to address. Um, it, write it down on a piece of paper. Give it to me. That, that's fine. Um, something that you may uh, may come to mind that you would like for me to address. Okay, let's look at this. Isaiah 35, verses 3 and 4. Tells us, strengthen the hands that are weak. Bolster the knees that are giving way. Say to those with anxious hearts, be strong. Do not be afraid. Behold, your God will come. Amen? Not maybe, not hope so. He will come. And he will be an avenger. And it goes on to say, your God will come as a rewarder. Not only take vengeance upon those the, uh, uh, in the world that seek to destroy it, but he will reward those that you and me that live for him. He says, my reward is with me. So he is a rewarder. He will come, and what? He will deliver you. Now, the three Hebrew children and Daniel didn't understand how God was going to deliver them, but he, he didn't deliver them from the fire. He delivered them through the fire. And more times than not, God does not move the mountain for us. He allows us to climb it. Why? Why has God allowed us? Because we learn more and gain more in the experience of climbing that mountain than we would have if it was removed. 
Remember what I said last week, and I, I, this is the thing I harp on because my name's Harper in my class, that God is more interested in what you and I are and are becoming than anything else. And he's more interested in you and me becoming like him. So when he looks at us, he looks at us facing circumstances and situations that will mold us and make us into his image. More so than, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like for this mountain to be removed. No, God says it's more important that you climb it. It's more important that you go through and you cross that river. Now, I like what Spurge, Charles Spurgeon said 100 years ago. Well, actually about 130 years ago. He says, when you don't understand and you can't trace his hand, talking about God, you trust his heart. Now, is God for you? Is he for us? Is he for my home? Is he for our lives and our homes and our children? Yes, he is for us. So that's where we place our faith and our trust. Isaiah 25 and 9 says that, and they will say on what? On that day. What day? The day he comes. Behold, this is our God. We have waited in hope for him to deliver us. Hallelujah. We have waited. This is our Lord. We waited in hope for him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his deliverance. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. We have waited for him. And he will come. So our hope and our confidence is in the God that we serve and that we know. You see, we're in a battle, folks. This is war. But we know that if we are killed in battle, all right, or even captured, that we're on the winning side. Victory is not a hope so. The victory is guaranteed, and he will deliver us. So he says, be strong and courageous. I want, he says, I want you to be strong and courageous. Deuteronomy 31 and 6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He, he will never leave you nor forsake you. That's also found in the New Testament. Our God is always with us every step of the way. He never leaves us. He's not a fair-weather friend. We're his child. We belong to him. And then he says in Deuteronomy 33, 27, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are his everlasting arms. When our kids were just babies, I, I remember with Ann, I'd lay her on, I would lay her on my chest, and I would sing to her, and I'd pat her on the back, and I would sing, you know, the old congregational everlasting arms. <laughs> you know, yeah, we, we can rest upon his everlasting arms. They're always strong enough for you and me. So we don't need to be afraid. Oh, look, we're human. There are human concerns. So, yes, th there, are, there are things that will concern us as we face the future. And yet I want to remind all of us that, you, you know, if we prepare our hearts ahead of time, then we won't be taken off guard. Because Paul addresses, he says, you know, the enemy likes to come in and get you unaware. That's how he likes to work, is take you off guard when you're not watching or prepared. If you're going into a battle, you always go prepared. You prepare yourself physically. You prepare yourself mentally. You prepare yourself emotionally. And you prepare yourself spiritually. And uh, you hear some of our, our soldiers even today that have lost limbs and burned and all that. They said, if I had it to do all over again, what? I'd do it again. I would do it again. for my na And that's for their nation and for their countrymen. And we give honor to that. We give respect to that. We give thanks for that. Well, if that's true in the natural for our country, how much more is it, should it be true of the believers for the Lord their God who holds it all in his hands? So he says here in 2 Samuel 22, verses 2 and 3, The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, 
is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my Savior. From violent men, you save me. He's our rock. He's our fortress. In him will I trust. Therefore, I will bless the name of the Lord. So we just have to, we have to hide the word of God in our hearts and in our minds so that we are spiritually, mentally, emotionally prepared for whatever may happen. There, I mean, when you think about Ida hitting Louisiana, I've got friends in Louisiana. You know, so, what you know, and, and their, their lives are disrupted. Their homes are gone. Uh, they're saying it's going to be weeks for some of these people to get electric back on. So they're, they're facing difficult and challenging times. You know, I tell people about Northeast Ohio. You know, we may have to shovel a little snow in the winter. We don't have hurricanes, very rarely tornadoes up this far. <laughs> you know, flooding, it goes into the lakes. You know, so, so there's, there's a lot of, lot of advantages living in Northeast Ohio. And we got, we got water nearby, too, you know. <laughs> so, but uh, we need to pray for those who are not as fortunate. <laughs> Psalms 90, verse 1, uh, 1b to 2, it says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He's our God. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. I love Psalms 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked and enemies came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though war should encamp against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the tr time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, and in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, and he shall set me upon a rock. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. He is everything that we have need of. I'm getting a message. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. If I'm at, because of the way we're, we're live streaming this, if, I, if you ask me a question, I remind me, I need to repeat it for their sakes. The question, not that I didn't hear it, but because they won't hear what the question was asked. All right, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong. That's what God asks of his believers. Paul talked about being a good soldier of the cross being strong and being prepared. But see, that's not just for difficult times. That's for all time. That's not for the ch just for the challenges that we face in life. It should be our goal each and every day of our lives that we want to be strong and be on guard and stand firm, put on the whole armor of God. He says three times in those passages, stand. Stand. Don't, don't retreat. Don't give up ground. Stand. Here's what he says in 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 3 through 5. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again. Anybody here born again? <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. We've been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, this is through uh, uh, the New Living Translation. Now we live with great expectation. And we have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure, undefiled, and beyond the reach of change and decay. 
And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation. What salvation is he talking about? The end of our salvation, his second coming, when we become exactly like he is. And he says, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Coming a day where this world's going to see the truth. I heard somebody today talk about New England, uh, the New Zealand prime minister talked about uh, vaccine mandates and all that sort of thing. He says, and this is going to be, this is part of the new world order. And uh, that's what he just said yesterday. In, in a press announcement, they've locked down. They've locked down their whole country, and they've in the last six months they had one person get COVID, and yet uh, they're doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And Australia is the test battleground for all this. You know, they got lockdowns. They're building. It's on the news. They're building quarantine camps already uh, in several places in the country, and they say they're for people coming in where if they're flying in, they're going to have to be quarantined for a couple weeks. Yeah, yeah. You got to believe that. I got property in Florida. I'll sell (laughs) you. All right. He says here, this is Hebrews, the 10th chapter, verses 35 through 39. He says, so do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Patient endurance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. Then, see that word? When you continue to do God's will, then you will receive all that he has promised. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. And my righteous ones will, will live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in, in anyone who turns away. But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. But we are, what? The faithful ones. The faithful ones. Um, Yeah, that's the end of that part. Okay. Well, there's another line. I can't can't find it either. It went off the slide. Okay. But aren't you glad you're part of the faithful ones? Who have you put your trust? All right, here, here's uh, things I want to share with you. There is a need today for spiritual alertness and proper preparation for the time is near. Revelation, the 22nd chapter, verses 6 through 21, has things to say about the end time, and it's basically the final chapter of the Bible that is written for you and me to prepare ourselves, to have a good spiritual, mental, emotional framework, mindset. And he says that you need to guard the words of this book in one pl- in one of those places. And he says, I want you to keep the words of this book. So I want you not only to be knowledgeable, I want you to guard them. Don't let anybody twist or distort it. And I want you to keep the words of this book. In Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, there are three things that he says here that I want you to do. He says, first of all, I want you to keep watch. Uh, and, 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 and we need to be k- keeping watch. Uh, we need to be careful. Uh, uh, these are, the, you know, folks, we got an enemy. We have an enemy who is roaring like a roaring lion who goes about seeking whom he may devour. So keeping watch here means to stay awake. What did Paul say? It's high time to awake out of sleep. Why? Because your salvation is nearer than when when you first believed. We're too far on our journey now to turn back now. All right? And then he says, I want you to stay spiritually awake. And how do you do that? You keep the faith and you keep being faithful. One of the things that I try to press home with uh, those in our discipleship class is that one of the first lessons that God teaches you as a new believer is faith. Now, what does faith look like? Well, it's very simple. 
faith looks like faithfulness. If you're going to keep the faith, you're going to be faithful. It's no more complicated than that. It's keeping the faith. It's keeping on keeping on. Keep on doing the right things. You know, look, church attendance is not only a good spiritual thing to do, but it's also a great habit to do. Where you schedule your time with the people of God and with God himself, gathered around his word, in his name, knowing that where two or three are gathered together in that place, God says, there I am. Um, I've had people say, well, you know, I can pray at home and I can worship. I said, I hope you do. (laughs) But what are you going to do with what the Bible says? Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And so much the more... As you see that day approaching, what are you going to do with that? Okay, enough of that one. Luke 12, 35 through 40, he says two things in this passage. You must also be ready. I want you to be ready. I want you to be prepared. See, if you're prepared, you won't panic. So I want you to be prepared. He also says, watch out for yourselves. In other words, I I still want you to be alert. I want you to be aware. I want you to be knowledgeable. Uh, I I, I want you to have a spiritual preparation ahead of time. One of my concerns as a pastor is that perhaps there are far too many Christians whose faith is weak. They aren't strong in the faith. The Bible says everything that can be shaken, even your faith, if it can be, will. But if your faith is in Jesus Christ, it cannot be shaken. So we want to make sure that our faith is translated into faithfulness. Uh, Three major threats to spiritual readiness. And I think when we think about difficulties, tribulation, pressure, end-time events, that there are three, three, these three things are the things that you and I are going to face and, um, and that the enemy is going to throw at us. And there's a lot of scriptures. We're going to share some of these with you tonight. But we want to start off with, with this. The first one is deception. The second one is pressure. And the third is temptation. So we're going to have deception, pressure, and temptation. These are the three elements that you and I are going to face. It says here, number one, uh, number one, deception. Matthew 24, verses 3, 5. It says, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and they will. Do you see that? They will deceive many people. Why? Because they didn't accept the true Christ. So they will deceive many Christians. Many, 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 uh, they will deceive many people. Jesus said also in Matthew 24, verses 24 and 25, for false Christ and false prophets, what? Will arise. And what will they do? They will perform great miracles and wonders to do what? To deceive even the elect. That's you and me. The scripture tells us, I think it's in John, he says, try the spirits to see if they're of God. For there are many false prophets that go out into the world. And what you see here, and here's the way the devil works. There's just a fraction of truth in what he says, but there's a whole lot of lie to doom you. So he'll make it sound reasonable. Think uh, Think about Eve. He'll make it sound reasonable. He'll even throw in a miracle or two to reinforce what he is saying. But folks, if we don't know the truth, then we can be deceived. And Jesus warned us. He says, now, when don't you remember I told you these things before? 
So he's reiterating things that he has told them before, and he says that they'll do great miracles and wonders to deceive even the very elect, if that were possible. So we, we want to make sure that we're not uh, falling to deception. Now here it says the antidote for deception is <coughs> what? The word of God in our hearts and in our minds. We want to hide the word of God. You see, tribulation or pressure will be intense during this time frame. And people's faith in Christ can be shaken if the word of God is not in their hearts and minds. And if they're not held fast with determination in all watch, watchfulness, vigilance, and alertness. See, that's why we need to hide the Word of God in our hearts. We need to, we, we need to start putting that away and tucking it away because we're going to need, we need it. We only need it for today. We're going to need it for in the future. So the Lord said, you know, don't even be, you don't even bother to know what you're going to answer in that day because I will give you that. Well, it's got to be put there first before God can restore it to our mind. And restore it to our heart. So the word of God is our antidote. Here's what Paul said in Acts, the 20th chapter, verses 29 through 31. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. I know that there's going to be wolves come in. They're going to savage you. They will not spare the flock. Remember what he said? Not everybody that says unto me, what? Shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that, what? Doeth the will of my Father. Don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. Because their works will reveal it. Even from your own number. Men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Even among you, he says, there's going to be those who are going to do that. He even mentioned in another place, he says, some people are even in ministry whose God is their belly, who are in it for what they can get out of it. They're not in it because of the call of God or for the sake of leading people in the right way. He says, so be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. For three years, Paul warned them again and again and again. Be alert. Be on your guard. Just because somebody necessarily does a miracle or a sign and a wonder doesn't mean that that's God doing it. So it's important for us to have a sound doctrine, right? Sound doctrine. And, you know, if your spirit is not bearing witness with it, then you've got to put a question mark on it. Look, I've been in church all my life. There's a few, there, there's been some services and things happen. And I said, mm, no, that wasn't right. Now, some, some, I understand that sometimes People can do things in ignorance, so I make allowance for that. There's been a few times it wasn't ignorance. It was a wolf in sheep's clothing. And they were there to, to destroy and to lead people, even the very elect, away from God. So here's what he says. I've reminded you for three years. I didn't stop for three years warning you day, day and night, day and night about those things that, that would come. He says here in Ephesians 4th chapter, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown away about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us. See that? Trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. King James Version calls it treachery. It sounds good. They're trying to trick us so that it even sounds like the truth. But it's not truth. It's a lie. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, 
who is the head of his body, the church. But he says, I don't want you to be immature about all this. I want you to be strong in the Lord. One more passage here. Oh, wait a minute. That, that, well, let's see. Well, we'll go, we'll go on that, this one here. Okay, the next one is pressure. First one is deception. You and I, everybody in this room is going to face deception. It's not some will and some won't. We're all going to face deception. And it's the word of God that we hide in our heart that will help us. And if you're hearing something or seeing th- something, then go, go to a mature believer if you need a good sounding board. Go to a mature believer who can guide you through all of that. It may look good on the surface, but it may, it may not be right. It could be false teaching. The second thing he says is pressure. There will be incredible pressure in trying times that will bear on the faith of true, genuine Christians. Uh, uh, we're, we're going to experience pressures perhaps like we've never felt before in our lives. And there will be pressures and stresses and strains that under normal conditions could easily be handled, but some will become shaken and rattled in their faith because the pressure starts to intensify. And this is what Jesus said in Matthew 24. It's going to be like birth pains of a mother with giving birth to a child. It's going to come in waves, and the closer you get to the end time, the more pressure, the more intense those things are. So we just need to know that as we see some of these things come to pass, that it's going to come in waves. It's going to do this number, but it's also going to increase in intensity. So we need to make sure that our calling and election is sure. Matthew 24, 9 through 13, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise and deceive many. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And, 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 say, and because lawless will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Amen. Three things there that I want you to notice. Three things. He says, here's what's going to happen. First, he said, first of all, they're going to be a fence. Look what's happening in our world, even in our own country today. Everybody's offended. Everybody's offended. You look the wrong way. That, that offends me. I, 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 <laughs> man, I probably told this before. Visiting, visiting evangelist preaching at this church. A lady came up after church. He said, I have something to say to you. He said, well, go ahead and say it. He says, your tie offends me. It was a colorful tie. He says, well, go get the scissors. So she went and got the scissors. He said, go ahead and cut it off. So she reached up there and she <laughs> cut, cut that tie off. Now he says, sister, your tongue offends me. <laughs> Everybody gets bothered by something. You were just living. But anyway, he says the key. He said, so, so he says, first thing that's going to happen, here's the digression. And, and I want you to get the digression that Jesus gave. He said, first there'll be a fence. Then what follows a fence is betrayal. They'll betray you. And then he says that betrayal will turn into absolute hate. For many will be offended and betray one another and hate one another. Now, what did Jesus say would be the hallmark of the church and the people of God? The love of God. That will be, he says, look, now we know how important sound doctrine is in the new birth message. And that's really high up, but he says, as far as what the world sees that's going to capture their attention, it's going to be your love one to another. But he says, as you reach the end time and the pressure gets so great that many will be offended and they will betray and then they will hate one another. 
The pressure, the key to pressure is endurance and perseverance. Revelation 1, 9, very first chapter of Revelation. I, John, am your brother and your partner in what? In suffering. And in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance. Here it is. In the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. God is calling you and me to have patient endurance. Patient endurance. Isn't it interesting that some people get an ingrown toenail and can't come to chunk Sunday school on Sunday morning because of it? Patient endurance. Keep it on, keep it on. He says, to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the Isle of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. Now, the Isle of Patmos was a volcanic island. Nothing much grew there. That's where they put all the really hardened criminals. And that's where John was put. And he says, look, I'm, sub I'm your brother. I'm your partner in suffering. He's acknowledging that the people of God suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. He was suffering. Did you know they boiled him in oil twice before they put him on the Isle of Patmos and they didn't kill him? That's because our times are in God's hands, not somebody else's. So he says in Revelation 13, 10 and Revelation 14 and 12, if anyone goes into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with a sword, with a sword he, or he will be killed. This calls for what? Patient endurance. From who? And faithfulness on the part of what? The saints. It calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. So it's important for us to be, look, if we can't be faithful, Jesus put it this way, if you can't be faithful over the little stuff, like worshiping God, reading your Bible, supporting the kingdom of God, if you can't be faithful over the little stuff, how can I give you anything else? So he says we need to have patient endurance and faithfulness is on the part of the saints. Then in Revelation 14, 12, it says this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. This calls for patient endurance, perseverance. It's because when we're under pressure, the... the, the, the <laughs> The, the human temptation is that when you're under pressure is to jump and run to get out from under that pressure. But Jesus is telling his people even ahead of time, even way back then when this was all written, John says, I'm your fellow brother and suffer. We need to have patient, enduring quality. And we need to have faithfulness. We just keep on keeping on regardless of, of the pressures that you and I will face. And so he re remember what 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 tells us. In this you greatly rejoice. See that word? Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith is greater worth. Right? Greater worth than what? Which perishes even though refined by fire. Your faith is more important than anything else in this world. Can I tell you that not only your faith is important, but your children's faith in God is important as well. They need to learn early that their faith in God is supreme in their life, not secondary. You don't put it after everything else and then expect them to be true to the Lord when the pressures come. They need to learn to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ now so that they have a trust in him. And he says that you may be proved, what? Genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor 
when Jesus Christ is revealed or when he comes again. So you want it to be praise, you want it to be honor, you want it to be glory, you want it to be wonderful when Jesus Christ comes back again and he, and he says that don't think it's strange that you've had to suffer a little bit in this. All right, we'll stop right here. Question. Anybody have a question or a comment that you'd like to share? Dave. Right. I, I like that somebody came up with the with the phrase, failure doesn't have to be fatal. Now I want that to sink in. Failure does not have to be fatal. So we can look. We're human beings. We don't bat a thousand. But it doesn't have to be fatal. I appreciate that, Dave. Amen. Another comment or question? Good to see all of these from Georgia House and Alpha House and Grantham House and my house and your house. And <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. I, let me tell you something about abundant life. We'll take good care of you. That's one thing we will do. We will take good care of you. You love the Lord? Thank you, Lord, for this night. Thank you for this time together in your name. We praise you for your mercy and grace to each and every one of us. May our faith be rock solid in you. May we display that faithfulness. May all who come behind us find us faithful. May the church be on fire for you. And may your grace be upon our lives. Use us for your honor and your glory. We don't want to just play church. We want to be the church. And so we thank you for all of your many blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say amen. Sunday was a great day. The picnic was fantastic.